Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and welcome to Finding Me in the ITB Networks. Today with me a very special guest and after we conclude the interview I'm sure you would have said we want more. With me today is Professor Mohobe Ramose. He is a professor of philosophy. Professor got his doctorate in philosophy come lord from the University of Louvain in Belgium and of course he has contributed in numerous articles and publications to the discipline of philosophy. I think the most interesting of course would be African philosophy through Ubuntu uh, and then he's published many articles um, which I, I suppose we will raise in the discussion and, and you, it will raise questions for the viewers as well. The first being I doubt therefore African philosophy exists and for anybody who knows a little but we'll think about the question of I conquer or I think therefore I am and this is to challenge perhaps those perceptions. Then of course the death of democracy and the resurrection of democracy, reconciliation and reconciliation in South Africa, in memoriam, sovereignty and the new South Africa and an African perspective on the strategic significance of HIV and AIDS for Africa and her diaspora. But we will come to those particular discussions. I would like to introduce my guests and to inform the viewers that because of the nature of this, this discussion and the extent and the depth to which we will raise the issues, this interview will be spread uh, over two weeks. So we will conclude the first section and the second part will then be played in the following week. But with that, I'd like to say um, good morning. Thank you very much for being here and for sharing your time with me, Professor Amosir. Thank you for the invitation, Croatia, and I am pleased to uh, participate in the conversation. You know, uh, from the first time that I met you, there was a, a good few months ago, uh, I was waiting to do this interview because I knew I had so much to ask. And I think that now that we're in it, coming close to the elections, we're at a critical time for South Africa. I, I want to start this discussion by getting to the very heart of the philosophical understanding of Ubuntu because you write in your book African philosophy through Ubuntu but in the research that I'm doing recently I find that there very often is a belittling of the concept of Ubuntu and if it's not belittling then the authors that write about it generally don't really understand what Ubuntu is. So what is Ubuntu? Why is it important and why is it necessary to see African philosophy through Ubuntu? Thank you. Uh, first of all, it is very important, I think, to make a distinction between writing in English about Ubuntu or any other subject and doing philosophy in English. Okay. So a lot of the writings that I see on Ubuntu are writings really that are about writing in English about Ubuntu. They are not philosophical writings about Ubuntu, okay. most of them. Why do I say so? Uh, if I may compare, one has to understand, for example, that a philosopher like Martin Heidegger does a philosophical analysis of the concept of being. What does it mean to be? So he's not speaking English when he analyzes the concept being. He even feels at a certain point obliged to use his own novel term, Dasein. Mm. Now, all this is because of a conceptual analysis of uh, the term being. Mm. I'm not imitating Heidegger, but I do exactly the same, precisely because I'm a philosopher with regard to Ubuntu. I actually conduct a conceptual analysis of this term. That conceptual analysis means that you have to take seriously into account two points. One, the fact that Ubuntu belongs to a particular language. And therefore, one has to be in serious command of that language. 
one of the things that will show us that people understand the seriousness of language mm -hmm. is that one would have to know that Ubuntu is actually a compound word. It is two words in one. Ubu is one, Ndu is another. They come together as one word, Ubuntu. And so one has to conduct a philosophical analysis, trying state, uh, uh, stating what does this Ubu mean independently? What does this Ntu mean independently? And when they come together as one word, what do they mean? It is not only confined to South Africa, mm. Uh, or even to the Nguni languages. In the Sotho languages, we have exactly the same term, but we use it, Bhutu. In Shona next door in Zimbabwe, we use the same term, but Hunu. We have it also in Kiswahili. So you can see that philosophically speaking, one has to understand all these nuances. Yes. If you do, then you will not come up with a catalog like we see in many writings. People just say Ubuntu is uh, uh, like, you know, being, 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 I, I am, therefore we are. What is, how do you arrive at What is the logic? What is the reasoning that leads you to that? Ubuntu does not know revenge. Ubuntu, how do you ever, most cultures don't like revenge. Yes. How do you actually show in a serious, in-depth analysis of the term, why Ubuntu does not want revenge. And does it not want it at all times? So, you know, uh, I am suggesting that the rest of the argument really can be found in detail in my book. All I want to state for now is that it is very crucial to make a distinction between writing philosophy in English and simply speaking English as if you are speaking philosophy. <laughs> Professor, you raise a very important point and that, that is the ability to, to fully articulate yourself on a particular topic um, empathetically and of course with knowledge. When, you, when you're speaking about something then you need to come from a particular viewpoint in which you have that kind of in-depth knowledge. And I find that knowledge is a major issue in terms of South African understanding um, and how people relate to each other and how we consider a form of transformation through the existing patterns of knowledge. Now you have been uh, basically uh, pointed out to be as the best or perhaps the top philosopher in Africa, the best of South, uh, philosopher in South Africa. UNESCO had a particular um, program where they invited the 100 best philosophers and you were the only one that was invited from South Africa. But yet, Ramose is an individual who is in many sense sidelined from mainstream media, sidelined from mainstream academia. I mean, Somebody as wonderful as you, and I'm not saying this just to boost your ego, but I know the kind of person that you are. Somebody like you should be in a position who, um, well, firstly, in a privileged position in terms of your access to information and your access to be, to be able to disseminate information and for people, especially the young people, to learn from you. So what is it about you that many, I would say, those who have power find threatening? Are you somebody that they should be afraid of? Or is it that you, you challenge conventional writing, conventional modes of thinking, and basically the whole concept uh, of this understanding of where we are today? In fact, it would be interesting to know why uh, 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 and how people perceive me as they do. I, I would be grateful really just to know why and how. But you know, um, the point is not very surprising uh, because it is to me very important that uh, the acquisition of knowledge is to be understood mainly not as knowledge for the sake of claiming that I know. No. Knowledge is meaningful mm. when it is, in fact, 
applied by the knower in practice. You see, yes. so uh, to know what is interesting because you may know what it is and so what. But to know why is even more interesting because it will tell you the what and the how of mm -hmm. it. And so what I'm uh, getting at by this is that uh, characters are different. People may and can know, but they may not know enough about the why to enable themselves to actually discern the point of putting this into actual practice. Mm. You see, mm. now, uh, knowledge is really not private property, even though we know that in the contemporary world, almost everybody wants to acquire copyright. You see, yes. for us in African communalistic thinking, it is a very funny way of doing things. It is already restricting the philosophy of sharing. Mm -hmm. You see, mm -hmm. um, um, what I'm getting at is, you see, once we understand that knowledge is to be shared, surely to sideline anyone, anyone, to marginalize anyone is already to impoverish yourself because you will know much less than you could have known if you were to involve and include every, every, everyone in the domain. Everybody has got their own story to tell. Even the mad people, by their madness, already challenge those who claim to be sane to actually question the meaning of sanity. Yes. And so, you know, this way of excluding others from knowledge is really counterproductive first to the person who excludes because they just don't trust themselves. If you trust yourself, you're open to all kinds of knowledge because you know you will engage in conversation, in dialogue. With I, I have to stop you there because we need to take this conversation and this dialogue further. Sure. And it's about raising very many important issues. It's about the truth, it's about transparency, and then that links, of course, to the entire concept of 20 years of democracy. But we're going to a break and we'll see you after that. Thank <laughs> you.